Okay, good morning. The last class. And I do want to say a couple thank yous. I really do. Um, we, we have a, an interesting situation here. Um, uh, just we prepare some things and then we would send it to Heather in the office. And most of you probably have never met Heather. Uh, but Heather uh, is a young lady that, um, you know, she's taken all of your, um, what do you call these things, handouts. And these kind of things are going. She she reproduces them, punches holes in them, and gets them in our box for us. So when we come in, it's all done. So if you see her, you bump into her, say thanks, Heather. Mm -hmm. You know she deserves that. And then the other thing uh, that I wanted to say is uh, I wanted to thank my wife for putting up with me during these 12 weeks because I tend to lock myself in my study and, uh, and uh, do everything I possibly can can do to, you know, make this work, and uh, <laughs> immersion preparation. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been a little tough on her. Um, <laughs> and most of you, I think, know um, uh, Jessica, it's just a, a member of the class, but Jessica is actually my partner in crime. She, uh, she is a professional writer. Uh, and writes books with me, and um, she also um, uh, does all the preparation, hel helps me get my notes together, and, and um, does some research, and she also uh, spends time, uh, you know, with the camera stuff, and it's a lot of time to put that together and get that up for you so that you can look at it during the week, so I want to thank you, Jessica. You're welcome. I really appreciate that. <laughs> She keeps me straight too. She's got her master's degree, so I have to watch what I do. <laughs> yeah. oh, of course, we want to thank Gary because uh, Gary came up with the idea of James, why don't you teach some classes and you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm happy for that. And, and, uh, and we were talking last night. We're, we're kind of um, you know conniving as to what we'd like to do in the future and stuff like that, based on some of the things you guys have told me and some other things <laughs> some of other people. So we're we're trying to put some good stuff together for the future. So. I hope you'll enjoy that. So let me open with a word of prayer, and uh, <clears throat> then we'll jump right in, okay? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this special day for, for all the ladies and uh, the mothers out there, and especially those in our church and our class. And I just want to thank that you bless their life, uh, help them to see Christ in their life, help them to be able to be strong and be in good health. We thank you for this opportunity to be together. And we thank you for this last class, and, and uh, we thank you for the faithfulness of everyone. Uh, and we just uh, pray that your Holy Spirit will keep inspiring us and uh, keep us true to the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Hi, good morning. There he is. Hey. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> hey. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you again. All right, we're going to dive in <clears throat> to, um, to the, um, what we call the purpose of this uh, book of John, uh, John 20, 30, and 31, which goes, how? Who would like to tell us what that says? Let's do it as a group. Go ahead, do it as a group. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Right. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Very good. Very good. That's the purpose of the, the book of, the, of, of John. Now, what we want to do is I would like to take that one step further today and get into that in kind of detail. This is kind of our today. We're going to look at uh, uh, kind of some of the detail uh, with regard to John 20, 30, and 31, and then we're going to review session 7 through 11, which would be fun. This would be normally your final exam. Uh, your your uh, uh, midterm, you you did real well, uh, uh, which was one through through six. So we'll we'll see how you do on the final. But basically, <clears throat> we'll make a kind of a discussion, a class discussion. We'll have fun with that. <clears throat> this first one, I want to point out some things to you with regard to uh, what we should know about John 20, 30, and 31, because it seems simple when you just read it and recite it. 
Uh, now Jesus uh, did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded here. Okay. Uh, but, but that, you know, uh, there are, these are written, what he did do, written, uh, chose to put them down, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that you might believe he uh, is the Son of God, and that by that believing, you end up with life in his name. Sounds simple. <clears throat> Let me tell you what he really was saying. Okay? <laughs> this is how this looks. <clears throat> and to do that, we're going to have to look at some original language. Now, I know you don't know Greek and original language and that kind of stuff, so I will be as slow and as intensive as possible. But <clears throat> here's what I want you to know. This entire uh, passage in John 20, 30, 31 <clears throat> is interpreted uh, by two different clauses. Okay? If you know these clauses, you get to what he's trying to say. The first is a correlative clause, and the other is called a hina clause. Okay? Now we're going to look at those, okay, and see what they look like. Um, <clears throat> in, in verse 30, it starts out with now. But when you look at that and read it in the original, it says... <clears throat> New on Kai. That's not now. <laughs> so what does that mean? We're going to look at that. And then when you get to 30, we have this little thing, dia. Remember we said it was a word used for contrast? But what we really have here, and by the way, there are 12 different ways to interpret but. So which one is it? Or is it any of those? So what we have here is a, a correlative clause. Okay? The contrast is secondary. So he's obviously saying something else. So here's what he's doing. In verse 30, this is the interpretation. And I didn't write it there for you, but uh, you, you'll see it as we go on. This is what he's saying. On the one hand, and then he goes on and tells you what he does. When he gets to 31, he starts with this. Yeah. And it says, on the other hand. Yeah. Now, how do I know that? <clears throat> I know that because if this were the only thing he used, it would definitely be a contrast between the two. But whenever this is, and this is pronounced men, M-E-N, -E okay? If, if, if this is hooked up with day, okay? What you have is a correlative <coughs> clause. And that means on the one hand. <coughs> so on the one hand, he's saying what he said at the beginning, these things were not selected, they were not put in here. But on the other hand, I've selected these. And this is exactly what we want to do. Now, in a minute, I'll get to that other clause, but first, I, I want to say something about this, because <clears throat> the, the signs are very, very important in this book. As we know, you have seven signs, you have seven discourses, and you have seven I am's, right? Okay? So as you look at those kind of things, you have to say to yourself, <clears throat> why is, is uh, well, the question you have to say is, because you, you're, you've learned a little bit about interpretation now, and you have to ask the why and, and, and the observation and the interpretive question of why these signs. Look, but these implying signs, the object of signs, are written. Why? Why did he pick these? Okay? There's a reason. Okay? Because these signs are sufficient. They're sufficient for connecting you with, or the reader with, the entire scripture, going the whole way back to Genesis. If you remember those signs in, what was it, chapter 5, or, or lesson 5, that we went through all the signs, you look at that second category, and you look at how they display who Jesus is, wow, where do they go? They're, they're not in the New Testament, they're, they're, they're way back here, in the Old Testament. So what this does is it connects and matter of fact, uh, many of you know uh, the scholar D.A. Carson. I like Carson. Um, uh, he's got a lot of good things. 
uh, to say. But what he says is this, which I think is interesting. Uh, he, he, he asked the question, uh, like we just did, what, what, what question does God really uh, want to ask here? Uh, what's John trying to do? Okay, he says in 20, 30, and 31, uh, the question is not, who is Jesus? He says this, the question is, who is the Messiah? Okay, now why would he say that? Think. Messiah is what kind of term? Very Jewish, right? Okay. Very Jewish, okay? It's a question that he believes creates a whole Christology in John, all about Christ being the Messiah. And that's exactly what he says. But these things are written that you may believe what? Jesus is the Messiah, okay? The Son of God. Okay, so the, the, the reason that that's so important is who Jesus is is important because D.A. Carson, I don't necessarily disagree with him, but he feels that a lot of this book has been written with regard to looking at the Old Testament, the Jews, for the Jews, so that they get it clear who he really is. Okay, the Jewish people learn these signs. And when they see these signs, and when they, when they saw them, two things happened. What? They believed, or they didn't believe. It, it was that simple. But those signs connected them with what? The Old Testament. It connected them. So it was that connection that, that was there. So I think he's, I think he's got a good point. I, I don't necessarily agree totally with that, that point of view, but he does have a good point. Uh, the contrast here, that secondary that I mentioned to you, it was, it's not, it, it's by, con by secondary, what I mean is I mean that there is a contrast between, between what was written down and what wasn't written down. You know, that's a, that's a simple contrast. There's no problem with that. So, uh, I mean, that's okay. But, but the fact that it's written down and it's not written down makes it kind of a secondary to what John is really trying to say here in that clause, because he's really trying to say, on the one hand, we have this. On the other hand, uh, what's on the other hand? The signs that he chose. These are the ones he chose, and he chose them because they are significant signs, and they're connected to the entire Bible, including the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible. That's why it's important. Um, just think, out of a plethora of signs that he could... He could pick. He chose these seven, and he chose them significantly. Uh, so the book is kind of, kind of, from his point of view, the book is kind of structured around making it clear for the Jews that had to understand this, you know, that if you get these signs, there should be no doubt in your mind. And what's the last sign it was done? Lazarus. Well, Lazarus raising someone from the dead, right. I mean, that's pretty clear, you know, if you can do these kinds of things and where that's going to take you. Um, so that's, that's what it involved. Oh, so oh. that's why, it, yes. Can we read it again as we're inserting those phrases instead of... Well, it's a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm warning you. It's, 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 yeah, it's, a, it's not as easy. We take out the butt, though, in place of on the other hand. Well, you can't take the butt out because the butt is there. No, on the other hand, you can say yeah, yeah, you can substitute it for uh, on substitute. the other hand. Yeah. Well, go ahead, read it to us for the. Well, we all, uh, Oh, okay. We can all read it. She wants you all read. It. Uh, <laughs> on, the, on the one hand, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. Now let me insert something here. In the presence of his disciples, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But the important things: many other signs. Okay, many other signs, implying that there were other signs out there that he did that are very important. Okay, and you'll find them in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and in Acts, and other places. Now we come to the butt, don't we? Well, not yet. We weren't quite there. Let's try it again. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so on the, on the one, one hand, hand, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But on the other hand, 
Beneath our written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All right, now we're going to insert two more new words. That, that does make a difference. Oh, wait, it, it'll make more of a difference. We'll do it one more time. <laughs> as, soon as, I give it, as soon as I give you the other two words. Remember I told you the second way that this is structured is not only through the particle and the uh, correlative cause, but also through the Hena clause. Now, the interesting thing about this, uh, it's, it's, it's spelled like this, yeah, like a big I and then a V and an A, but it's called Hena. Okay, Hena clause. Okay, there's two of them. One talks about purpose, one talks about result. Now, here's the interesting thing about this that's kind of fun. If you look at the first one in 31, it says, on the other hand, these are written that, okay, that you may believe. Okay, that you may believe. The first that, okay, is, is mostly a hena clause, okay? And so it's, it's translated kind of in terms of, of, of the result. So another word that you could substitute for that, word that, is result, okay? So the result, okay, is that you may believe that, there it is again, okay, the hena clause again, and that means purpose. So the way it's translated there is purpose. In order that, in order that, okay, and then the result, those two. So now let's read it with a, all these insertions. Okay? Well, before we do that, we have to make sure we're clear on the 31, these two things. <laughs> okay, all right. And, and Are you clear? No. <laughs> but so, well, you say, but the... Okay, so on the other hand, the these, resulting these in. are written, yeah, for the result of, result resulting in, in, I don't know. In yeah, these, that, that's right, it's a Hena clause, so it's in order that, or as a result, uh, as a result, this will happen, that will happen, you know. For, or, okay, so yeah. for, for the results, these are written. I wouldn't say for. These are, these <laughs> are written. It's, it's kind of in order that. It's in order that. In other words, I'm giving you the word result, but it's the final, okay. the final thing that will happen. In order that, in in order order that, that you may, what? Believe, okay? So they're, they're written in order that the end result is that each one of you will believe, okay? Now, we have another Hena clause, which means purpose. For the purpose of knowing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have what? Life in his name. Exclusively, only under heaven and earth. Only name under heaven and earth. Whereby you can have life and be saved. Alright? So you see the power in this? When the Greeks read it, when the Hebrews understood what he was saying, and when that, that meant, that was very in your face. <laughs> in terms of what it is that, yeah. Now, well, since you have been through the entire book... Jay Carson was correct then, to say that, the, that this, these two verses are very important for the idea that, for the purpose of showing that Jesus is the Messiah. Correct. And the Son of God. And those, the Son of God. Those two things, yes. Because, mm -hmm. um, do, I don't want to get into this but, but uh, in, in detail, mm -hmm. but, but are you familiar with Unitarianism, any of you? All right, let me ask you a question. If I ask you, are you a Unitarian or are you a Trinitarian? What are you? Trinitarian. Trinitarian. Thank you. <laughs> don't, <laughs> let anybody, don't, don't let anybody talk you out of it. Okay? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what you are. Uh, Unitarians see Jesus as unified, a one, one God. They see one God, but they do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay? They do not believe that you can kill God. So when Jesus died on the cross, that was impossible. There's a lot of things, and they teach this in schools, and uh, uh, that kind of thing. So I just want you to be aware of where they're coming from, um, and if you don't know much about them, uh, ask Siri to tell you. 
uh, uh, you know, just uh, go in there and she'll give you information and websites and you can look at it and look it up and all the rest and that's all you really need to know. But the important thing is you need to know is that, uh, is that John's whole assumption, somebody tell me what John 1, 1 says. There you go. Remember, it's correct. It's structured by four was's. <laughs> that says funny. Four was, was. The word was. Remember, I told you. Four was. 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 Okay. Okay. So that you understand the structure, and that's why he takes you there, so that you can go back to the in the beginning. Okay. Creation at the very beginning. That's how it connects. So Jesus was in the beginning with God. He wasn't an agent of God here on earth. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what they say, agent. Okay? I just want you to be aware of those little things, little, you know, because you can be tricked. Okay? And you need to be well aware of that. Okay. Um, so, now that we have that, um, on the one hand, um, Jesus did many uh, other signs and uh, in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But on the other hand, when you really look at this, uh, these uh, are written with the result that you might believe. And uh, Jesus is the Messiah. That's what we want you to believe. And he's the Son of God. And, and, and that by believing, by believing, you know, okay, you, 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 you're going to understand that this is the purpose of why I'm reading this. This is, this is, I'm writing this. Everything that you've studied is based upon that purpose uh, that you, you might believe in. Believing, of course, will result in your life, having eternal life. You see how he, that's how, that's how it reads. It's okay. meatier than first glance. You know? Yes. <laughs> yes. <Thank you>. yeah. <laughs> Much meatier than first glance. And I, I thought, you know, I really need to share that with you because I think it's important. The second thing, uh, that I wanted to talk about with regard to uh, um, this prologue and this epilogue uh, uh, confirm that Jesus is from the very beginning, like I just said, and he's also tied up at the end. But now we have to ask this question. How does John select the material in his testimony? You know a little bit about the signs, because we've, we've gone to that. But I want you to see something. Number one, <clears throat> he's connecting signs and discourses and all the rest of them. But he's... He's, he's allowing the signs to sum up all the things that Christ wants to reveal about himself and who God is. That's important. The next thing that's very important is making sure the disciples were witnesses. Notice that phrase, even in, the, in, in, the, uh, in John 20 and 30, 31. Uh, you know, uh, many sides of the on the one hand, many said, but what, who, where? With who? In the presence of the disciples. You see that? That's very important. Because those witnesses are very important to all, all the different things that happen. <clears throat> it implies a historical accuracy. There's an accuracy there. And that's what's important about that. Um, then, the declaring the I am statements reveals the sovereignty of God, which we talked about the Trinity, and we just talked about the importance of the Trinity. Uh, so, we're now to another place. In verse 31 is the main statement, and it guides the whole thing. Notice, this is not a doctrine. The Gospel of John is not a doctrine. It's, it's not a theology. Okay? It's not a, 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 a pedagogy. Okay? Some great teaching idea. No! Okay? But it's based on principles of faith and believing. Pistos, faith. The same word for believing and faith. Same word. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, this goal was using literary skills. What John did is he, his whole goal was to use his literary skills the way the Holy Spirit helped him to structure and select the things to talk about in order to maintain that purpose. That's what it was all about. And now that you have gone through the entire Gospel of John, from beginning to end, that should really resonate with you. That this is what he's all about. <coughs> Everything in there is what this is about. Um, then then uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to emphasize again 
uh, how he selected his material in terms of, of, you've heard me say the things that we just went through, but one of the things that, that I love about John is when you look at your chart and you see what's going on here, and most of you, I hope everybody got the new chart. You know, if you didn't, uh, Kelly or Jessica or somebody has it. Uh, okay. Uh, make sure you get hold of this. And keep using it as you study. You know, write things on it. You know, uh, I highlight things on mine. I'm sorry. I do that because you're welcome to. You know, whatever it does, it helps you to see it. And remember how he teaches. He teaches in these blocks. Okay? That's, a, that's critical to understand because many of the Gospels, not many, but a couple of them, uh, confuse that. Now, Matthew, what he does is he puts everything in a, in, in a section in a little block. I mean, you got miracles, then you got parables, then you have, you know, you know, just like that. And it's fun to study and it's good to look at. But what John does is he actually starts here and he takes you somewhere. Okay. And the final thing he wants you to declare, what? is it that John wants you to declare at the end of all of this? I believe Jesus is the Christ. The Son of God. Yes. And, 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 and who did that really well for you in John 20, 28? Who? Thomas. Yes. Um, How did Thomas say it? It's, it's a climax. It, it starts here and it goes through the book and it comes to the climax with Mr. Doubter, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and he sees him standing there in front of him and says, Come on, put, your, put your fingers in my hand. Huh? Yeah. My Lord and my God. My Lord, now listen, and my God. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. That's different than my Savior and my friend. <laughs> yes. That's, that's not the same thing, okay? My Lord and my God. <laughs> And that's what he's trying to commu uh, communicate in chapter 1 of, uh, of John, and also the connection with Genesis. <coughs> that this is God, okay, that we're talking about here, all right? So that's, that's how that works. Um, any questions before we get to the fun stuff? <laughs> this is fun. Right. This is fun? Yeah. Did you get that? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, it, it's, it's, it gets a little sticky, but... <coughs> <clears throat> the reason I, I take the time to go through this with you is because you have been through 12 weeks of this and you've worked hard at it. And a lot of you have learned a lot of things and have talked to me and, and sent me messages and things. I, I just, what I want you to do is know that there's a lot of me here. <laughs> and uh, don't stop reading John. Don't, don't say, oh, I took that course with James. That was great. No, 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 no. no. You took a course, you picked up a few goodies. What I need you to do now is study it on your own. Now's the time to open the Gospel of John by yourself and say, mm -hmm. now that I know what I know, you know, <laughs> let me start reading this thing. And, and, and then you start to go through it and see how it jumps out at you. And see how it, the, the passages make a difference. It's a, it's a great, great book. And uh, it's very, very fascinating. Any other questions? Everybody got it? All right. Okay. Do you have a handout that looks like this? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to read it. You're going to take the exam. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what it says. We have defined the gospel as good news. That is only what God, through Christ, has done for us. Everybody clear on that? I mean, you're never going to allow somebody to say to you, what is the gospel? And then say, well, it's good news. And then kind of walk away, right? You're really going to tell the truth. Now, you know what it's all about. You know who the gospel, what the gospel is. And you know how the gospel works. Okay? One of the reasons that young Christians and people who want to be Christians have so many problems with, the, with our, their faith at the beginning is we didn't tell them the gospel. What we told them was, Jesus loves you. That's, that's great. You know, I don't disagree with that. But it's not the gospel. They need to learn the gospel. If you tell your children the gospel, they'll know who they are. They'll know what their problems are. 
and they'll know how to move forward. Yes. See? That's how it works. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Okay. If someone needs to write a new song. <laughs> <laughs> Too many love songs? Yeah. No. Jesus, Jesus loves me, me just yeah. doesn't cut it. <laughs> Jesus loves me. New, new verse. With, with the yeah. same yeah. tune to hang on to it. That's right. Fill in the okay. gaps. <laughs> All right. We are enemies of God. Look, look at, look, read, read these, Jessica. Read them for me. There's four, four points here. Now listen to what she says. This is really important. Listen. Okay, so, uh, so we have learned that, one, we are enemies of God. Two, we are living under a curse. Three, we are born totally deprived as sinful human beings, unable to save ourselves. And four, God's holiness is offended by us. The gospel is the only answer to our reconciliation with God. That's very good. I think I don't think I need to say anything more. You certainly have that, right? You got that down? You can handle that with your kids, with your wives, with your husbands, with your... <laughs> I don't see you fit into a song, but... <laughs> All right. okay. 15 verses? Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. John 5, 17. But Jesus answers them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Jesus did nothing for the kingdom without His Father. And we can do nothing for the kingdom without Jesus. Somebody read me 15.5. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, that's pretty clear. Anything about that you don't understand? <laughs> that's basically how it works. Like Jesus had to depend on his Father to get the job done and do it right, we have to depend on Jesus to do the job and do it right. There it is. Okay, three. Jesus teaches about himself. The Father loves the Son. Remember, this was amazing. This is the only book where Jesus actually talks about himself and his Father. Jesus teaches. The Father loves the Son. The Father shows Jesus all he is doing. All he is doing. Thirdly, the Father commands Jesus to raise the dead and give life. Wow. Fourth, the Father gives Jesus the power to lay down his life and to rise it up. To take it back up. Any questions? This is what Jesus taught us. All right? You said this was the only book where Jesus talks about his Father? Like that. Oh, like that. Not like that. He... he the, 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 he tries to really make it clear, you know, his relationship with him. As a matter of fact, it gets into a lot of arguments, as you all know. We've been through the passages in 5 and 8 and all that kind of stuff with the, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the Pharisees. Yeah. You know, just lots of arguments over this. They called him a blasphemer and just mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in John 5, 32 through 35, Jesus provides a witness to who he is. And now... Jesus talks about this. I have witnesses. Now, why did he say, why was it important for Jesus to say, I have witnesses? Somebody tell me. Yes, that was established in Jewish tradition in the covenant that they had to prove right they were. In Deuteronomy, it tells you uh, Deuteronomy tells you exactly how many witnesses you have to have. Two. Uh, two or one. Yeah. And that kind of thing. So, Jesus said, okay. <laughs> And by the way, they rejected all these. You know that, remember? Okay, the first is Jesus proves witness. He said, my first witness is John the Baptist. John the Baptist has witness to him. John the Baptist witnessed to us as well. Remember, he was crunched in between some things there when we talked about John the Baptist at the very beginning. Okay, and where he actually um, said that when he saw, he was given by God the insight to know that when he saw the Spirit um, land on someone and remain on them, that's the key, remaining, okay? It remained on him. When it remained on him, he knew that that was the Messiah. That was Christ. And so he's a great witness. Well, they rejected that. And, and then uh, he went on and he said, uh, what about my works? What about my signs? Here they are. See? What about the signs? Well, we, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe you're a magician. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't know how you pulled those off, but, you know, they were very interesting. 
Uh, remember Jesus Christ Superstar, where Pilot asked him to walk across his swimming pool? You know, that's, that's, that's the idea. That's pretty much how they saw it, you know? Okay. Matter of fact, Hollywood sees it that way still. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thirdly, uh, Jesus' Father, because they are one. Now, that got him in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. They are one. And understanding the one. We went through all those passages. Then, the oh. scriptures and the prophets. So, he went back and he showed how all the scriptures testify to him. And how that works. Yes. So... On the Jesus' father, because they're one, mm -hmm. did, did he just sort of do that to say that? Well, okay, so let me say it like this. On number four, the scriptures and the prophets, we can go back to the Old Testament and we can read where the prophets and the scriptures, and even in Psalms where they, where they prophesize it that, to expect Jesus, all right? So that makes sense, but <clears throat> was he really, what was, is there something we can point to with his father, or was he just kind of being... That's a really good question. You know why? Because at the last minute, when Jesus was having dinner with the disciples, a guy named Philip said, Look, Lord, just show us the Father and we'll go in. Yeah. Remember that? Right. And what did Jesus say? You know. Oh, I've been with you. He was shocked. Oh, yeah. He was shocked. He was shocked. Mm -hmm. What did he say to him? Yeah. You know me. You know I've been me with you so long. long. Yeah, you've been with me so long. If you've seen me, you've seen, seen me. Long. Long. That's your answer. So that's why it's a testifying to himself and to who he is in the relationship with the Father. You can't do that unless you're believing the truth. But other than the book of John, I mean, we saw that in, in John. We didn't see that in the other Gospels. I mean, this is really something. Well, he does testify to himself as Father in the other Gospels, but not like this. Not like this. He really lays that out loud. here. It's he real clear. And the reason John does it is because John rejects a lot of the <laughs> the extra stories and concepts and ideas of the other Gospels. Because, in particular in Matthew, because it, Matthew is very, very Jewish. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's really, it's really hard. To, you know, I mean, I, I spend a quarter of the course reminding people that Jesus is a fulfillment mm -hmm. of that of the, those laws and prophets. Mm -hmm. and, and we no longer are under the uh, Mosaic Covenant, which you have all learned, right? We all know that, okay? But let me ask you a question, just since this is the final. <laughs> here, here, here's, here, here's the question. So now we don't keep the Ten Commandments because they're not important anymore, right? No. All right. Two commandments. Well, yeah, they're down to two, thank you. You're good. You're good at that. But we don't keep them anymore, right? Because we don't need to, right? Written on our hearts. Yeah. It's from the heart. Explain that. <laughs> no, 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 don't give me a pass. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know if you can convince me of that. What did Jesus do? You can help him. Go ahead. <laughs> because, because, because the commandments were given under the Mosaic Law, which... Under the Mosaic Law, where you, no one could keep it, it wasn't possible. And now, with Jesus' death and resurrection, we keep them because they're on our hearts. And He helped, he, He's the one who does it for us. Okay, but basically, you just told me what He told me. Okay, Sarah, the explain Holy, it to them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Holy Spirit at this point. Um, did not dwell within the believers, it dwelled among the believers, but separated through the tab like um, through the walls of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Spirit of God could not dwell in their hearts yet because that propitiation hadn't been made and they were still unclean. Um, but then when like New Covenant, we have the Holy Spirit and that propitiation's been made. And we can make that, um, we can go directly to God, to God, um, and he can communicate directly back, back to us. So we don't need to go through the law in order to um, be sanctified. Liberty University, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's that's working. What, that's what, it's working, Mom. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens. She went right back to where? Where did she go? 
Old Testament and said, listen, back here in the tabernacle, uh, Shekinah glory, boom, it was on top of the tent and all that kind of stuff. And then it went to where? Solomon's temple. Then it went to where? The second temple period. Then it went to where? Herod the Great. Build it again. And then what, where does it go? Sarah? Right after the end. That's what he said. No, he it's said, in our hearts. he lives in our hearts, that's good, but what I'm trying to get at. What are you trying to get at? There you go. There you go. Back to strategy. I'm trying to get at is that, that the Ten Commandments, as we look at the Ten Commandments, and that's all, are called the Decalogue. Jesus took those Ten, ten Commandments, and Ken had the answer. Basically, he put it into to two thoughts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that covers what? The first four or five. That has to do with God. Okay? And then he said, the second is like unto it. And there were waiting for him to say something else. And he says, basically, love your neighbor as yourself. Because all the rest of them were horizontal. The first one, it's a vertical relationship. The other is the horizontal. Okay, how we relate to each other. <clears throat> so the law lives in Yes, the law lives in our heart, but it comes out through the Holy Spirit, now resides in us. We are now the temple. That's just what I want you to say. Just tell me, you're the temple. That's who you are. You're the temple of God. And that's where God resides, in you. Okay? And if you walk by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the temple. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's correct. Yeah. That's what we're saying. All right. What's the next one? What number am I on? <clears throat> Five. Five. Okay. Jesus reveals himself as God of all creation, whose name is I Am. We heard that back in the Old Testament, right? Okay. So he's the bread, the light, the door, the shepherd, the resurrection, and the life, the way, the truth, and the light. And, most of all, the true vine. All right? So we've got it all there. Now, by the way, when we went over that, and we studied that in class, and we looked at some of these, uh, the one thing I didn't get a chance to do was contrast uh, the true vine passage in 15, 1 through 8. What I'd like to do is kind of contrast that with Romans 11. <clears throat> so if, right, right, just write in your little margin there so you have that. That If you go to Romans 11... Uh, it's actually Romans 11.11, 11, but actually, regarding the vine, it's Romans 11.17. Okay, and basically what 17 and following does is Paul unpacks it for you. He unpacks John there and tells you exactly what John was trying to say about the vine. Okay, and how that works. So when, next time you read John and you get to 11, 1 through 8, jump over to uh, Romans 11 and 17 follow on, and, and read that, and that will help interpret that for you. So you get insight to it. All right? Yeah. Six. Jesus' high priestly prayer. Oh, boy. 17. Jesus was given this priestly function in the order of who? Yeah. Not through the order of Aaron and the Levites. Tell me why, 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 why. Because he died. Independent of that covenant. Pardon me? Independent of that covenant. That, that's right. Okay, so all depend. And, and, and no longer involved with priests and, and offerings and sacrifices and all that kind of thing. Over and over and over and over Aaron, again. Over and over and over again. Aaron the high priest. Okay? Understanding, you know, Dad, we went through that in the relationship to Genesis 14 and with regard to the Abrahamic covenant and Psalms 110 with regard to the Davidic covenant. Uh, and in Hebrews 7, 21 through 22 with regard to the new covenant. Very, very important. Okay. All right. Seven. John only used these verses to explain the actual accounts of Jesus' death. John 19, 28 through 30. Now, remember us saying that out of all the Gospels, he only gives three verses to the death of Jesus. And then we said... Why would he do that? <laughs> okay. However, he sprinkles information about Christ's death throughout his entire gospel. He works it and wiggles it into almost every conversation along the way. So it's all there. 
So, for example, John wrote about the new birth in 3.7. Jesus being lifted up in 3.14 through 15, like, it, uh, like the serpent was in the wilderness. The farewell teachings to his disciples in chapters 14 through 17, and in his temple cleansing in John 2.19 through 20. All of them are related to the death of Jesus. Fascinating. The guy's a brilliant writer. I mean, it's a way, of course he had a little help, which is really fair. <laughs> Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. But, but basically, to put that together like that is really um, a wonderful way to, to, to teach something. Eight, what really happened at the cross? Remember we asked that question? The following words are important. Here they are. Propitiation, the sufficient sacrifice to satisfy God's justice and wrath. Atonement, we talked about, we believe in penal atonement, substitutional atonement, okay? The imputation of our sins onto Christ and the imputation of Christ's righteousness onto us. That's what we believe. All right? The penal word is a, is a judicial word. It's a court-type word. It's a forensic word. It means basically justice has to be done, okay? God has to be justified. Uh, uh, satisfied. <clears throat> Number nine, Christ's death on the cross provided salvation for all human beings who will believe that Jesus is what? The Messiah. And? The Messiah. There it is. I mean, right there. Then ten, when we learn from Peter's reinstatement, okay, what did we learn from Peter's reinstatement? Somebody read some of that. What we learn from Peter's instinct. When we selfishly stop loving God to protect our pride or do what we want, God remains open to our repentance and forgives us, no longer holding our sin against us, and totally seeks reconciliation. Jesus looks for what is dying in you in order for you to be sanctified. In the secular world, people are living the way they want and will die. Christians in the kingdom of God are dying to themselves in order to live. That's how it works. Like that? <laughs> it, it really helps clarify for people. That's why I use it. You know, it really, it really says it properly. Now, now, talk to me about this. If I were really knew you personally and as a Christian and sister and brother in Christ, it would not be unfamiliar for me personally, particularly in the first century, to 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 talk to you about, brother. What are the kinds of things that are dying in you? Because that's what Jesus was looking for. What's dying in Peter? Peter was humiliated. His pride was hurt. He, he, he couldn't believe that Jesus predicted what he was going to do and it happened. <laughs> it just, you know, it was just too much for him. And he decided to take six other guys and go fishing. And Jesus said, I didn't teach you all this for three and a half years to go fishing. <laughs> I taught you this to fish for men. Go feed my sheep. And so this reinstatement put him back in the right track on the right track for understanding who he was. And sometimes things have to die inside of you about who you think you are and why you're the way you are. Mm -hmm. In order for Christ to really mold and shape you and for the Holy Spirit to do the work in your life. It's very important. Right? Yeah. All right. That was, uh, that was 10. All right, we have a couple more. <laughs> 11. This was a long class. <laughs> long, 12, 12 sessions. John's prologue and formation of his Christology in 1, 1 through 3, we are not children of God who are born of natural descent. That's not who we are. We are not people who can add to our salvation by moralism. Somebody explain. Come on. You can't do it by works. Right. Can't do it by works or what, what else? Moralism. What do we say? Well, that acting, right? There's nothing we do. We don't bring anything to yeah. the we grace We don't God. bring anything to the table. Right. And, and just not works toward our salvation, but anything. If I could just change my behavior, then I would be different. If you're a Christian, you can't change your behavior. 
Yeah. Only the Holy Spirit's going to do that. That's the key. And so when we, 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 we see this, we have to recognize the fact that the prologue and the formation of who Jesus really is is why we can walk in faith now. That's the only reason. One term for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the advocate, the spirit of truth, is only found in five farewell passages in John. That's it. There they are. They're listed for you. Plus one in 1 John 2, 1. And by the way, it's nowhere else in the New Testament. That's it. Okay. The paraclete <laughs> denotes the Holy Spirit sent by the Father at Jesus' request for the disciples and all believers. This became activated when? Pentecost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and uh, by the way, why did Jesus feel it was necessary with his disciples to try to help them to, to, to uh, comfort them with under, an understanding that the paraclete will come? And I think I had you write down that we, we talked about that. All the things the paraclete would do for them. You know, there's a list. Okay, why, why, why was he so concerned about that? What was going on in their minds and hearts? Well, they could think he was leaving them. Yeah. They wanted to be alone. Yeah, they were mourning. They, they, what do you mean you're going to die? What do you mean you're leaving? What, what, and you're not coming back? Why? <laughs> you know, what, what is this all about? You know? I mean, we can't do anything without you. He changed that, didn't he? <laughs> but I mean, basically, this is what the paraclete's all about. That advocate the spirit of truth. Now we get to the good stuff. We started talking about sanctification for John, and it becomes Christ becoming fully formed in us. Underline that. Fully formed in us. When somebody says to you, what is sanctification? It's Christ being fully formed in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Not an experience independent of saving faith. In other words, it's not we, we get regenerated, we get justified by uh, faith, uh, we uh, get eternal life, we get glorified someday, and we have to work like little buggers uh, <laughs> to, 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 to make it, uh, to be sanctified. And, and become more pure and, and like right. No, 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 that's not how it works. Okay. So, it's required a list of works and responsibilities for us to complete our salvation? No, no, no. For John, the entire plan of salvation requires us to embrace our new nature, embrace the new nature, and everything given to us as part of the gospel. Regeneration, Justification by faith alone, sanctification, and our glorification. How much of us do we contribute to any of those things? Well, nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing. <laughs> All right. Very, very important. Yes. I had to learn last week, but I wanted to make a contribution to the class on, okay. <laughs> on a verse um, that that proves what you just said. It's, oh, it's first, and it's my life verse. First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. All right. I'll read it. You want me to read it? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> first Thess Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. He does it. He does, he does it all. The, the thing that we have to be watch here, it's, it's, as, as Christians, we desire to do the right thing. And so what we do is we have our agenda, and what we do is we take our agenda, and we kind of manipulate the agenda because it's not, we don't see anything bad with it, there's nothing bad about it, but we manipulate kind of what we want, so, and then we get the Holy Spirit to kind of rubber stamp it, or Jesus to rubber stamp it, and we do this a lot, this is common among the Christian community, common, 
And what we need to do is we need to understand how Christ works. And we need to understand how the Holy Spirit works within us. It takes time. Don't let anybody tell you that between now and the time you die, you're going to be totally sanctified and perfect. That's crazy. Yeah. It's mean, a bigger should, job than that. It's a bigger <laughs> job than that. Right. That is not going to happen. But what is going to happen is that you're going to learn. Now, here's the downside. The downside is this. When you mess with God, and when you mess with the Holy Spirit, he has no problem disciplining you. What do you, say, what do you mean when you say mess with? What's an example? Manipulate it. Okay. When, when, when you, if I come, if I say, you know, Lord, I have always wanted to um, uh, be the pastor of, um, of um, that first Baptist church in Dallas. Okay? Where my friend Jeffers is. Okay? I always wanted to be the pastor of that church. Okay? So, now, what I do is I go out and I talk to everybody. I meet with the people in their church. I, you know, buddy with them. I don't know what else I do. I guys are looking for something. Now, I'm setting myself up and I, I'm getting myself and then, voila! The committee says, we would like you to come and be the pastor here. Got myself in a lot of trouble. The church is okay with me. I can probably handle the church. That's not the issue. It's that I'm not doing God's work now. I'm doing yeah. my work. See? That's what we got to be careful. Out in front of God. Out in front of God. We're out in front of it. You know? Things take time. I just wish Christians would learn that. It's, it's through time that you are perfected. Through time that you become... Um, Everything that God has in mind for you. Okay? And that's what we have to do. We just have to remember that. I, I, I share that with you again and again and again. And hopefully it sinks in. But that, 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 that's a real life lesson. You know? um, 14. For John, it is more accurate to describe sanctification, and, and this is how I'd like you to learn it, as a slow transformation in becoming like Christ in character, behavior, and attitude. That's what it's about, guys. All three of those. Character, behavior, attitude. Okay? And it's slow. It's a slow process. I don't even like the whole process. Not a long, drawn-out process with perfection at the end of the tunnel. Uh, remember we had this big discussion about process? The problem with it is you don't know where you are on the line. Some may be here, some may be here, some may be here. Okay? But then what happens? Every time you do something wrong, you slide back on the scale. You know, now you're here, and now you're here, and that you can't you can't work with God that way. God is it's not a process. What it is, is it's a transformation that goes on in your life. And it's based on not your decisions on you and God working together to move you where you want to be. That's the exciting thing. Where he wants you to be. Where he wants you to be. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, hopefully it's the same place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that's how it works. Okay. So John does a beautiful job laying this out. I mean, it's, it's just a, read Jesus' prayer. I mean, the high priesthood prayer is phenomenal. Okay. For John. This is a more accurate way to describe it. Then, 15, lessons from the Christian community are what? What are our lessons? The gospel is not a launching pad for programs. What do I mean by that? Three ways to love your wife better. <laughs> That's right. Three ways to love your life better. Uh, Gary and I were laughing about this. How to stop sinning. How to, how to, how to, how to. I said, Gary. So have any more courses to say how to. <laughs> okay. But there are issues. I mean, sure, we have to know the how-tos. I'm okay with that. But that's not what he's talking about here. The gospel is not a launching pad for programs. What we're supposed to be launching is the gospel. When we launch the gospel, the right programs fall in place. You know, it comes together. Um, 
And that's the way. But the church today is what the church has done. And it's done everywhere. So you can't pick on this church. It's every church. You know, and what they do is they, they try to find out what your felt needs are and what your real needs are, and then go out and they create programs for those. And then they get the Bible and they look up, what did we learn about getting the Bible and looking up things to figure out if there's a passage that fits it? Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah. yeah. Remember? Literary. Huh? Systematic versus literary. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, try, I'm trying to get at Remember the two charts I gave you, the one that goes this way? We were start up here with our idea. <laughs> and then we, little by little, we get down here to, I found it in the Bible. There it is. It's my idea. I, know, I knew it was right. You know? That kind of, as opposed to the way you've learned it here, which is the opposite. You observe what's there. You interpret what's there. You figure out how it's applied. And now you have a belief. That's the correct way to go out <coughs> Bible study. Okay, we call that independent Bible study, um, inductive Bible study. I don't know what you want to call it, mm -hmm. but it's basically what we're doing. What we do here is we try to ask simple observational questions, simple interpretive questions, so that what we can do is get to the truth by allowing the Scripture to interpret the Scripture. That's how it works, and if you do that. It'll just make a tremendous difference in your life. I mean, you know, and remember, I've been through, I've been through the ropes. Pastor, consulted, majored in philosophy in college, went to theological seminary, got all the degrees, heard all the lectures. Now I got a son going through the same thing, and 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 all the rest. Of it. And so, you know, it, it's amazing what's out there. But when it all comes down to it. It's either biblical exposition and what God is really trying to communicate mm -hmm. to his infallible and inerrant word, or it's somebody's idea. Mm -hmm. And you gotta make up yes, your mind. Yeah, yeah, you gotta make up your mind. Who you gonna call? Okay. Uh, that gets us to uh, throughout the 16, throughout the entire gospel, according to John, a clear Christology pops off the pages due to John's literary style and structure, which you saw right here. When you, when you can read a Bible, uh, book of the Bible and structure it in a way that the author meant it to communicate to you, that is exciting. That gives you truth for life. I mean, that is, that is really great. So, it pops off the page. His typologies, remember the typologies? My, my friend, when Sarah just gave you there a second ago, that's a typology. You know? She went the whole way back to the Old Testament with the tabernacle of the tent, went right, right through and showed you where it now resides. That's a typology. Okay? So that, that same thing. His allowing scripture to interpret scripture and his sprinkling <coughs> symbols and themes like light, remember, darkness, remember how he used them? Symbols throughout and communicated this truth throughout his whole book makes it truly unique and not like any other book written in the New Testament. That's a fact. It's an exciting book. All right, now we have the purpose of the gospel according to John. <clears throat> now, above now, you should write on the one hand. <laughs> okay. Jesus did. By the way, if your Bible says performed, I, trust me, there is no Greek word there anywhere that is interpreted performed. Okay? Performed so, sounds like, like a stage. So absolutely, production. absolutely. Magician. You've got it. Yep. Yeah. He did many other signs in the presence of his disciples on the one hand, which are not recorded or written in this book. But on the other hand, or on the other hand, on the other hand there are those written that you may have this result, yes. that you may believe what? Jesus is the Son of God. And, the and that believing you may have a life result. Name. You will have life in his name. That's uh -huh. it. Now you got it. Okay? That's how it operates. Any, any uh, 
Anything you want to talk about? Any questions? You see how you see how this works now. Uh, if you if you go to if you go to John 15 and you listen to me read this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me, in me, get this, in me, that bears no fruit. Which every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, okay? While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes. So that it will be even more what? Fruitful. That's some of the discipline, some of the things that have to happen, okay? To make things work. More fruitful, okay? Then what does he say? You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Just hear that. Will you please? I mean, you're, you're not a dirty, no good slob. <laughs> okay? I mean, I'm sorry if people call you that. <laughs> but the bottom line is the way Jesus sees you is you've given your life through faith. He's regenerated your heart. You're, you're a Christian. You're a believer and all the rest of it. And you're clean because of his righteousness being, being imputed to you. Okay? Now listen. Remain in me. <laughs> there it is. It's the same thing John Baptist said. Remain. Remain in me. Remain. Don't go off with your own thing and do your own stuff. Remain in me. And I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If, if means condition. On the condition that a man remains in me, I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do like David always told us. Nothing. Nothing. Okay? If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away, withers, such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Then he goes on. And then he goes on, uh, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Listen to this. This is your promise. If you believe, and if you remain in him, and don't try to call him up and tell him what your agenda is, and how you would like it rubber stamped, if you would be willing to allow him to sanctify you in your work, in your family, in your personal life, in everything that you do, if you do that, you just ask anything, and it will be yours. Okay? He's like a good father who wants to please his children. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit. Showing yourself to be my <coughs> disciples. Okay, there you go. I don't know how else, how long to put it. I mean, that's pretty clear. And 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 like I said, in Thessalonians, when uh, we went back there, uh, everybody remember what that passage that was we talked about? Yeah. 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 I, I just uh, what was it? First Thessalonians five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that the one that we read in class? Before? I have four, three, first Thessalonians four, three through eight. Somebody look at look, look at that and read that to me. Mm. I think it uh, it just sticks in my mind. It constantly sticks in my mind because it, it makes plenty of sense. Yeah, about sanctification. Yeah, 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 yeah. Read it nice and slow. Listen to this first verse. It is God's will that you should be. Design. Yeah, now think about that. Is there anything about that that you don't get? You hear that? Is there anything about it you don't get? It's pretty clear. Well, okay. So don't come to me and say, well, what do you think God's will is for my life? You see what a dumb question that is in light of the scriptures? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's my point. 
Now, like I said, we discussed that. We went through all the immoralities, all the problems, and all the rest of it, and the kind of things that he says. And we read through that whole thing and discussed it. I get it. I, I understand that. And basically, he puts a lot of emphasis on what you should be doing and what does not work. Okay? And he makes it very clear. And if you're not clear on that, you should go back to the next class and look at the video. Because we spent a lot of time on that. But what I want you to hear is he's... It's very clear in the scriptures, there and other places, what God wants for you and what his will is for you. Okay? God does not want you to all become missionaries, our pastors, our preachers, our the best church worker in America. That is not his goal for you. Okay? He doesn't care if you are in a business or if you're working for a high-tech company or if you're have a business of your own. Are you, that, that's not God's issue. God's issue is you. He wants to know, uh, will you honor me in that company? Will you be who you say you are when you do the work of that company? Will you, uh, will you treat your wife and your wife treat your husband the way you should do that according to what I've taught you in my word? Will you sanctify that relationship together? Yeah, I wrote an article some time ago on our website. We have a website called uh, netaffirm.org. Uh, I guess it's still on there. I don't know. But basically... I, yes, uh, it's yeah. still there. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Jessica knows more about this stuff than I do. But, 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 but basically, it was how, how the man works to sanctify his wife. And it's the other way around, too, by the way. Okay? So, I mean, these things are scriptural. They're the kinds of things that God wants us to do, and they're very clear. And what we do is, like uh, Patrick was saying to me this morning, the world really comes down on you. The world out there is tough. And, and, and to make decisions and to do things with your life is not easy. He's right. I mean, you know, you can have a wonderful wife like his and three girls, and be challenged 24-7. I mean, because all those girls are going to live and have to function in the world. And wow, today, in our society, in this postmodern thing, ooh, I'm glad I'm not raising kids. It's just, you know, it's yeah. water. It's and, <laughs> <laughs> well, and here's your encouragement right here. First Thessalonians 5:23. Yep. And now, and may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. It's God who sanctifies us. We don't have to. That's right. Do it ourselves. It does it completely. He does a good job. He does exactly what needs to be done in your life now, and He will help you to get to the next level. It's trust. You have to trust Him, or you have to say, "This is what I like." I'm going to do it my way. Come on, rubber stamp, rubber stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Someone talked to me recently and said, God will, will answer that prayer, even when it's your thing, not his thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's scary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we learned in here. I wish you were in here. We, 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 <laughs> we learned in here that if you're praying, there, there's a prayer that Jesus never could pray. And that's the Lord's Prayer. Why we call it the Lord's Prayer? Got me. It had to be, to be somebody that was uh, uh, on a committee uh, putting, the, <laughs> putting the Bible together and it, thought that would be cute. Because he, they asked him, how should we pray? He didn't say, here's the Lord's Prayer. This is how I pray. <laughs> that's not what he did. You want to hear him pray? You go try to pray chapter 7. <laughs> See how well it goes for you. <laughs> that's the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the difference. You know, we, we, He's given us things to see and to overcome. And you can pray. And He hears. And He listens. If we remain in Him. That's the key. I mean, you know, those of you who have children, you know. What verse is it that, we, that our, our prayers are according to His will? That uh, He will hear it and He will, he will answer that prayer. He will answer those prayers. Right. Is that in John? I'm not sure. David, you were trying to give me? 
Yeah, where are you going? Well, I thought we said about marriage, mm -hmm. this application in marriage relationship. The husband and wife should grow together to become more and more like Jesus, right? Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, the bride and the church, you know, is the husband and wife. Right. right. That's why Jesus used that. Now, uh, the, the wife or the husband are not supposed to be like taking on each other. That's right. right? Or Boston and Keish are the wrong thing. Like you're cheating, you're doing it, doing that. Right. That's, that's wrong, right? Right. Absolutely, it's wrong. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. not the right way to go at it. Yeah. No, that's not biblical. No. No. Yeah. No. 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 And uh, and also, uh, you know, these two, this what the husband just grow, grow in love over time and sanctification. The the the, the wife becomes the husband. Helps the wife become less. Like, more Christ like in the wild of the husband, you know, more Christ like. Absolutely. In love, grace, and kindness, and all that. That's right. And, and it represents like the, the body of the church. Absolutely. That's exactly, that's why Paul even used that, that, uh, yeah. that analogy. Mm -hmm. That's exactly why. You know, here, here's the whole thing. Here's what we do. We get married, and for those of you who are not married, this will be fun for you here. But what happens is we get married, and we say, okay, here's the rules of our marriage. Here are the rules of our marriage. <clears throat> I'm going to do this. I'm going out with the girls on this night. I go to the boys on this night. We're going to do this. I don't want to do that. I'm going to have this job. No, if I don't like that, I'm going to have this job. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And you know, yeah. Wait a minute. You just had a preacher stand in front of you and talk about how you were going to commit your lives to Christ together, become one in spirit as well as one physically. And, and now we have a situation where you're setting up your rules. And now who's, who's going to, how's that going to work? Who's going to keep them? I'll tell you why it's going to keep them. The guy's going to get mad because she doesn't keep them. And the girl's going to get angry because he won't keep them. That's what's going to happen. Why do we throw God out when we go through a consecrated piece of life. We do the same thing when we get into uh, uh, business. You know, we do the same thing with business. Mm -hmm. We get into our business and we, well, okay, well, go ahead and cheat on the tax You know, I'll, I'll go ahead and do the deal. God's saying, hello, hello, hello. Remember me? <laughs> Remember me? You know, you, know uh, you want me to bless your business? You want me to help you? How can I do that when you're doing that kind of stuff? Let me give you five examples out of the scripture of, of people who tried that number and it didn't work. Remember? He, he can give that for you. So, so I'm just saying, if you really truly are going to believe John, and you're going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that he is God, and that really he truly lives inside of you, that you are the holy temple of God, if that is really clear, then there's no reason why marriage or any other relationship that you happen to have with the outside world, you shouldn't be remaining in Christ while you're involved in that relationship. Now, I, I, I'm with you. I understand that the world's going to make it tough. They're not going to want you to do that. That's why you are who you are. Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Hang in there. I know what you're going to go through. It's not going to be easy. Okay? But if you stay with me, I'll stay with you. And it will work. And there's many, many testimonies to that. Sometimes we hear them in church and other places. But that's, that's, that's the key. It's not easy. It is not easy. We make more excuses for why we want to do what we want to do than mm -hmm. it's just amazing. And I'm going to get Everybody does it. Yeah. Show us what it works. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, anyone? Kelly, I gotta say, I'm real impressed. I don't think you missed. Maybe you did. No. You twelve. <laughs> twelve right. classes. Kelly's in high school. She's going to uh, do some college work next year. She's capable mentally of doing things like that. But basically, um, to have a high school person in here to go through this. This is tough. This has not been really easy. I'm really impressed. Thank we you. love Kim. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. Very impressive.
Okay, very good. All right, uh, who would like to pray? Go for it. Lord, we thank you for uh, the life and work of Christ that we got to see through John's eyes and what he was highlighting with your help, uh, Holy Spirit guiding him. We thank you for uh, the men and women who preceded us, who have passed us down faithfully, and in your grace you gave us an awesome story here to see and understand better you and have you revealed to us by your power, Lord. We thank you. Uh, up until this point in history, Lord, it's landed for James and others to facilitate this class. We thank you for the environment um, that we've been in. Lord, we ask that you would write these things on our hearts, that we would see Christ in these scriptures. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would reveal him and change us as we see him, Lord, to be people who are these things, who don't just act a certain way, but are being changed to be more conformed to you, bringing you more glory, God. We pray that you would be highlighting specific things from this class in the coming weeks and days and months for us, Lord. We ask that you would put people on our path to share these truths with, that they would benefit as well, Lord. And we ask that you would just help us to be faithful in that simplicity, Lord, to say that you are Christ, you are God, our Lord, you are God himself, and we believe and trust you, Lord. So in the different ways that each of us are learning where we ought to be trusting you, where we are not, where that trust is incomplete, God, I'm asking for you to show us that. Give us boldness to address that, Lord, and for you to meet us in that place. And bring strength where there was weakness, Lord. Just, uh, we're really excited about who you are, God, so keep showing us more of that. And, uh, yeah, bless us as we